welcome back in the last lecture uh, i introduced uh, ammonia water systems and we discussed the properties of uh, binary mixers of ammonia water this lecture is a continuation of the earlier lecture and in this lecture i'll uh, discuss in detail the working principle of uh, ammonia water systems so the specific objectives of this particular lesson are to explain the working principle of absorption systems using ammonia water pair with some of its salient features explain the principle of rectifying column discuss briefly the steady flow analysis of the system explain the principle of triple fluid absorption systems and finally compare uh, absorption and compression deferential systems at the end of this lesson you should be able to explain the working principle of ammonia water system and its salient features explain the operation of uh, rectification column with enthalpy composition diagrams perform a steady flow analysis of the system explain the basic principles and features of pumpless triple fluid systems and finally uh, compare compression deferential systems with absorption systems so let me give a brief introduction absorption deferential systems based on ammonia water they are one of the oldest uh, referent systems which were developed at the end of uh, 19th century these systems can be used for both refrigeration and air conditioning application because the ammonia is a refrigerant here so it has a very low freezing point and you don't have the problem of uh, uh, like in water where it cannot be used for sub zero temperatures and uh, these systems are available uh, in very small refrigeration capacities to very large refrigeration capacities and mainly they are used in the uh, in domestic refrigerators in pumpless form and also in large uh, cold storages now the operating pressures uh, in ammonia water systems are much higher than atmospheric so you do, you do not have the problem of air leaking into the system this is one of the typical problems of water lithium bromide systems which operate under vacuum so you always have air leaking into the system this problem is not there with ammonia water systems and you also do not have the problem of crystallization uh, which was again a typical problem with water lithium bromide systems however uh, ammonia is not compatible with materials such as copper or brass so normally the entire system is fabricated out of steel and ammonia is both toxic and flammable so we need to take certain safety precautions while designing and operating these systems now let me explain the operating principle uh, major difference between this system and uh, water lithium bromide system is that uh, you use uh, three additional components uh, here and these three additional components are a rectification column a deflagmator and a subcooling heat exchanger uh, without rectification vapor leaving the generator may consist of 5 to 10% of water uh, and uh, the need for a uh, rectification was explained in the last class if you do not rectify the vapor you have 5 to 10% of water in the refrigerant circuit this will create problems like uh, non isothermal condensation and evaporation and it will also increase the evaporator temperature it increases the Uh, circulation ratio so ultimately the system performance suffers so in ammonia water systems uh, they have to be designed in such a way that uh, most of the water is confined to the solution circuit only and uh, in the refrigerant circuit you have almost pure ammonia so this requires uh, the use of a rectification column okay and the rectification column consists of the generator a rectifying uh, column and deflagmator so this is uh, something uh, different between uh, different fr from water lithium bromide systems okay and what is the function of subcooling heat exchanger the subcooling heat exchanger is used to increase the refrigeration effect and also to ensure that only liquid enters into the refrigerant expansion valve now let me explain the operating principle okay so as i mentioned you have the for basic components here you have the evaporator condenser absorber solution pump and generator in addition to these basic components you also have an additional heat exchanger here a subcooling heat exchanger and you have uh, what is known as a deflagmator here and you also have a rectifying column rest of the components are similar uh, like your uh, solution pump uh, expansion valve liquid suction heat exchanger all these com uh, components are similar to water uh, water lithium bromide systems so the working principle is like the, like this let us begin with uh, point 14 which is nothing but the exit of evaporator so at this point you have low temperature uh, low pressure refrigerant vapor this low temperature low, low pressure refrigerant vapor enters into the heat exchanger 1 
where it exchanges heat with the refrigerant liquid coming from the condenser. In this process, the refrigerant vapor gets superheated and the liquid gets subcooled. So, this is uh, so something similar to your liquid suction heat exchanger used in uh, vapor compression refrigerant systems. So, okay, so, what comes out of the heat exchanger is a heat superheated uh, vapor still at low pressure. So, this superheated vapor now enters into the absorber. In the absorber, it comes in uh, contact with the weak solution coming from the generator. So, this is your weak solution. Okay. Weak solution here means weak in uh, refrigerant. So, this weak solution and uh, uh, ammonia vapor coming from the evaporator, they come in contact in the absorber and the refrigerant is absorbed in the absorber. Since this is an exothermic process, heat is rejected in the absorber and what you have at the outlet of the absorber is a strong solution at point 2. Okay. So, at point 2 you have a solution that is rich in ammonia. Okay. This is still at low pressure. So, this uh, strong solution is pumped to the generator pressure using a solution pump. Okay. So, in the solution pump it is, uh, it is uh, pressurized and this high pressure uh, solution which is still at low temperature uh, enters into this heat exchanger 2. Okay. In the heat exchanger 2, this is nothing but your solution heat exchanger where uh, it exchanges heat with the hot solution coming from the generator that means uh, at point 6. Okay. In this process, this uh, strong solution uh, becomes uh, preheated. So, it comes out at higher temperature. So, temperature at point 4 is much higher than temperature at point 3. So, this preheated uh, strong solution enters into this rectifying uh, column. And in this rectifying column, uh, this strong solution falls through this uh, rectification column and it ultimately comes to the generator where you supply the heat and because the heat supply vapor is generated and this vapor uh, gets rectified in the rectification column and deflagmator. And finally, what you have at the exit of this deflagmator is almost pure uh, ammonia that means almost about 99.9 percent uh, ammonia. Okay. So, this 99.9 percent uh, ammonia vapor which is at high pressure and high temperature goes to the condenser. It condenses in the condenser by rejecting heat of condensation Q c to external heat sink and it becomes a high pressure liquid 0 0.11. And the high pressure liquid at 0 0.11 now flows through the heat exchanger where it uh, rejects heat to the vapor coming from the evaporators. In this process, it gets subcooled. So, at 0 0.12 you have subcooled refrigerant liquid still at high pressure. So, this subcooled liquid, liquid refrigerant at high pressure is expanded in this expansion valve and uh, the resulting uh, mixture of liquid and vapor at point 13 which is now at very low temperature and low pressure enters into the evaporator. It uh, takes the heat from the refrigerated space, provides the refrigeration effect Q e and in this process it becomes a vapor and this vapor goes to goes back to the heat exchanger and that is how the uh, refrigerant uh, circuit is completed. Now, coming back to the solution circuit. In the generator, uh, refrigerant vapor is removed from the solution. So, what you have at the exit of the generator is a weak solution 0 0.6. So, the weak solution at 0 0.6 which is uh, quite hot and which is at high pressure now flows through this solution heat exchanger where uh, it uh, uh, gives off heat to the strong solution coming from the absorber. So, in this process, the temperature of the weak solution reduces from uh, T6 to T7. Still, since this is still at high pressure, uh, its pressure has to be reduced to that of absorber pressure that takes place in this uh, solution expansion valve. So, at the exit of the solution expansion valve, you have low pressure weak solution that is 0 0.8. This low pressure weak solution now comes in contact with the refrigerant vapor coming from the evaporator and absorption takes place and that is how the solution circuit is completed. So, this is the working principle of no vapor of, uh, ammonia water system and this is actually a, you can call it as a single stage ammonia water system okay this is a typical uh, system used in uh, most of the commercial in installations okay uh, so the analysis and uh, analysis of this system i'll explain a little later before uh, coming to the steady flow analysis let me explain the working principle of the rectification column this is the rectification uh, or the rectifying column which consists of the three components and let us first concentrate on this rectification column. Uh, before uh, explaining that, uh, I forgot to mention one thing. In the deflagmator, uh, the refrigerant vapor rejects some of the heat to a heat sink. That means, some heat rejection takes place in the deflagmator. That heat rejection is given by Q d and during, due to this heat rejection, some of the uh, solution condenses in the 
deflagmator that is known as reflux. Okay, so I will explain this uh, while uh, explaining the rectifying column. Okay. Um, so now let me uh, just uh, summarize the energy flows into and out of the system. We have seen that uh, high temperature heat input uh, is given to the generator QZ and uh, low temperature heat input uh, is given to the system at the evaporator. This is nothing but your useful refrigeration effect QE and then heat rejection takes place at absorber, condenser, condenser and deflagmator. Deflagmator is a new component here and a small amount of work input is required to run the solution pump. So, these are the typical energy flows into and out of the system. Now, let me explain the principle of rectification. So, the, as I explained already the rectification system consists, uh, consists of a uh, generator, a rectifying column and a deflagmator. So, let me show the schematic of it. So, you can see that the whole thing is your rectification system. It consists of uh, three components generator and uh, this is your rectification column. rectification column and a deflagmator. Deflagmator is at the top of the uh, rectifying uh, column and uh, heat is supplied to the generator, high temperature heat QZ is supplied to the generator via a heating medium. So, uh, because of this vapor is generated, uh, okay, so vapor is generated and vapor moves up. This vapor comes in contact with the strong solution coming from the absorber. Okay. So, there is a direct contact between the strong solution and the vapor in this lower portion of the rectification column. As a result, uh, we will see that uh, this vapor becomes rich in ammonia. That means, uh, by the time this vapor comes from this point, the lower portion to this point, it becomes stronger in ammonia. And further enrichment takes place in this column, where the vapor comes in contact with a reflux that is coming from the what is known as a reflux condenser. Sometimes the deflagmator is also known as reflux condenser. Reflux condenser. So, in the reflux condenser what happens is some heat is taken out of the um, uh, hot vapor um, by using a cooling water and during this process some of the vapor condenses. That uh, condensed vapor is called as reflux and due to gravity this falls down and as it falls down it comes in contact with the vapor that is uh, moving up. That means, the descending liquid comes in contact with the ascending vapor and during this process further enrichment of the vapor takes place and ultimately what you have at the exit of the rectification system is almost a pure ammonia. That means, as I already mentioned you have about 99.9 percent .9 uh, ammonia in the vapor. Okay, it's uh, almost uh, pure ammonia. Okay, so in order to achieve this, you have to design the rectify rectifying column properly. Now let us concentrate on uh, each component. That means uh, the lower portion of the rectifying column, and let's see how uh, what is the working principle of this, and how do we show this on enthalpy composition diagram. Similarly, uh, we will look at the upper portion and explain the working principle and uh, show this on enthalpy composition diagram. Okay, so, as I said you have seen that uh, rectification system consists of the three components and a heating medium supplies the required heat input as, a, as I have already mentioned to the generator and heat QD is rejected to the cooling water in the deflagmator. Okay, so, at one, uh, one place you supply a high temperature heat, at another place you um, uh, reject some of the heat. Now, let us look at the generator plus lower part, uh, part of the rectification column. Um, Okay, first let me show the working principle. Okay, so, you can see here the generator here, this is the generator G and this is the lower portion of the rectification column. Okay, so, you have in the generator you have weak, you have a solution of ammonia and water okay, and from the top uh, strong solution of ammonia is coming from the top. Okay, so this is uh, what is coming from your absorber. Okay, uh, and uh, heat is supplied to this uh, solution bath at the bottom portion. You are supplying the heat to the solution here. As a result, vapor is generated. So this is the vapor moving up, and vapor has a initial concentration of zeta W V. 
Okay. So, this vapor moves up and as it moves up it comes in contact with the liquid that is coming down. Okay. So, the liquid is coming down and remember that this liquid is much cooler and it is coming from the solution heat exchanger. So, its temperature is always lower than the vapor temperature. So, the hot vapor comes in contact with the strong solution in this column. Okay. What happens then? So, you can see this in the enthalpy composition diagram. This is the state of the vapor at this point, okay. State of the vapor at this point, okay. That means at the lower portion of the rectification column. This vapor comes in contact with the solution that is entering into the uh, uh, rectification column. And what is the state of the solution that is entering into the rectification column? That is this, okay. So that you can see that there is a temperature difference between the vapor and the solution, and uh, the vapor is much hotter than the solution. As a result, heat transfer takes place from the vapor to the uh, solution and in this process the temperature of the uh, vapor reduces and the temperature of the solution increases. Simultaneous to heat transfer you also have mass transfer. Okay. How mass transfer takes place? When heat is supplied to the solution that is coming uh, into the system some ammonia vapor is generated. Okay. That means uh, uh, ammonia is generated from the solution and this ammonia vapor will be mixed with the vapor that is moving up. So, you can see that as the okay. So, as the vapor is moving up its state is shown by this arrow here that means it becomes progressively rich in ammonia. So, okay. So, you, you can see that its concentration varies from this point to this point. That means, it gets enriched in ammonia and at the same time its temperature drops because of the heat transfer. Simultaneously what happens is since you are at, uh, stripping uh, this solution of ammonia obviously, its concentration has to drop. So, you can see that uh, its concentration is decreasing in this direction. Okay. That means, the vapor concentration increases in this direction and the solution concentration decreases in this direction. Okay. So, the net effect is that the vapor becomes uh, rich in ammonia and the solution becomes weak in uh, ammonia. Okay. So, that is what is shown in this uh, process, okay. so, how the temperature increases. And if uh, this rectification is perfect, uh, you will find that at, the, at this point, uh, the strong solution that is entering into the system will be at equilibrium with the vapor that is leaving the system. That is what is shown here. Okay, so the, this solution, um, yeah, this uh, vapor is at equilibrium. Uh, this solution, liquid is in equilibrium with vapor that is leaving the system. Okay, of course, in actual case, this is not possible because uh, for perfect uh, uh, rectification and perfect equilibrium, you require an infinite column. So in an actual system, you'll find that there is no uh, equilibrium is not there. Okay. One advantage of uh, this uh, particular uh, system is that uh, you can see that some of the um, heat is transferred from the hot vapor uh, that is coming from the generator okay. and this heat is given to the solution that is going to the generator. That means, the solution that is going to the generator is getting preheated by extracting heat from the vapor. Okay. This is beneficial because uh, obviously, this will reduce the required uh, heat input in the generator. Okay. Uh, otherwise, if, uh, let us say that if this is not there, uh, then it has the entire heat has to be supplied by the external medium in the generator itself. Uh, okay, and uh, this is wasteful because ultimately the vapor has to go to the condenser, and it uh, the heat will be rejected in the condenser to a low temperature heat sink. Okay, so instead of uh, throwing it uh, to the low temperature heat sink, you are extracting some of the heat from the vapor before it goes to the condenser. Okay, so this is uh, uh, good as far as the system COP is concerned. Okay. So, ultimately uh, uh, what has happened in this particular uh, lower portion of the rectification column and the generator is that there is an exchange of heat and mass between the vapor and the liquid. Okay. During this process, uh, vapor becomes hot and it becomes weak in ammonia and uh, vapor, uh, I mean sorry, the liquid becomes hot and weak in ammonia and the vapor becomes uh, co cool and uh, rich in ammonia. Okay. Okay, so, that is what I have summarized here. Heat and mass transfer take place between the ascending vapor and descending liquid and ascending vapor is enriched in ammonia and descending liquid becomes weak in ammonia and in an ideal case vapor leaving will be in equilibrium with liquid entering. Solution entering the generator is preheated. So, this is beneficial as required heat input is reduced. Now, let me explain the deflagmator or reflux condenser. 
Okay, so this shows the upper portion of the rectification column plus the d flag matter as you know that this is the d flag matter d. Okay, what is happening in this one you uh, the vapor that is entering into the d flag matter is nothing but the a vapor that is leaving the lower portion of the rectification column. Okay, so that uh, enters into the d flag matter and uh, let us say that it moves up and at the upper portion it rejects some heat to the low temperature heat sink. Okay, so this is the heat rejected in the d flag matter q d. So, as a result some liquid condenses okay, and this condensed uh, liquid uh, which is called as reflux moves down. Okay, so, the liquid is moving down and vapor is vapor is going up okay. and this vapor temperature is much cooler than the liquid temperature. So, again uh, there will be exchange of heat and mass between the vapor and the liquid. Okay. So, the net result is that at the end of this column you have a very pure uh, ammonia. Okay. Uh, which goes to the condenser and the refrigerant circuit. Again this is shown in the uh, temperature uh, uh, composition diagram. You can see that uh, zeta S V this is the condition of the uh, vapor that is entering into this column and as it comes in contact with the reflux you can see that its temperature drops and at the same time it is getting uh, rich in ammonia. Okay. So, you can see that finally it leaves. Uh, at this concentration which is much higher than this concentration. Okay. So, enrichment of vapor is taking place in this column. At the same time the liquid again becomes weaker because some uh, ammonia is generated since you are taking ammonia out of the solution uh, obviously its concentration reduces. Okay. So, liquid uh, follows this path and vapor goes in this direction. Okay. And uh, since there is heat transfer uh, during this process liquid temperature increases in this manner and vapor temperature reduces in this manner. Okay. So, heat has to be rejected to the uh, low temperature heat sink Q D. So, again uh, this is a summary of uh, what I have explained at the top of the deflag matter heat is removed from the vapor. So, that a part of the vapor condenses which is known as reflux. This reflux that is cooler exchanges heat with the hotter vapor ascending in the column. During this process water vapor is transferred from the vapor to the liquid and ammonia is transferred from liquid to the vapor. And vapor leaves the rectification column in almost uh, pure ammonia form with a concentration of greater than 99 percent. Now, how, how, what do we uh, so far we have explained the working principle of rectification column, but how does it look like or how do you design it? So, the rectification column could be in the form of a packed bed or a, sp a spray column or a perforated plate column. Why do we need a packed bed or spray column or a perforated plate column? Because we need to have what is known as a large residence time so that the fluids can spend uh, more time together so that there will be high heat and mass transfer rates so that ultimately you get almost pure ammonia vapor at the uh, exit of this rectification system. Okay. So, you have to have a higher heat and mass transfer rates. So, you cannot simply have a hollow tube in which uh, liquid and vapor comes in contact because the in such case there will not be enough time for uh, heat and mass transfer to take place. Okay. So, uh, if you want to design it properly you have to have something like a packed bed or a perforated column or a spray column. Okay. So, that liquid comes in intimate contact with the vapor and uh, heat and mass transfer can take place. Okay. Now, let us uh, briefly look at the steady flow analysis of the system. Uh, this is carried out in a manner similar to water lithium bromide system that is by applying remember that uh, for water lithium bromide system we have carried out the steady flow analysis by applying heat and mass balance across each component. Okay. For example, if you have to do this for ammonia water systems. What you have to do is you have to take individual component apply heat and mass balance. For example, if you take the condenser uh, remember that if you apply heat ba mass ba energy balance to this you will find that Q C is equal to mass flow rate of refrigerant into H 10 minus H 11. Okay. Similarly, you can do an energy balance for the for the evaporator. You can also do an energy balance for the heat exchanger. Okay, uh, energy coming in is energy going out since it is a steady flow process. Similarly, you can do uh, steady flow energy balance for the other components like uh, uh, solution pump, uh, solution heat exchanger, absorber and all that. Only difference between this system and ammonia water system is at this point.
Okay. Of course, this point is also the solution heat, the subcooling heat exchange is also di different, but this analysis is fairly simple. Okay. What is the major difference is uh, in this uh, portion. Okay. So, I will show you how um, uh, steady flow analysis has to be carried out for this portion, so that you can evaluate the performance of this particular system. So, and uh, there is one difference here. Uh, in uh, water lithium bromide uh, systems, uh, when we say strong solution, uh, that means the solution that is strong in the uh, lithium bromide okay, the, and weak solution means solution weak in lithium bromide. Whereas, in ammonia water system, the meaning of strong and uh, weak solutions are different. Uh, when I say strong solution in ammonia water systems, that means the solution that is strong in ammonia, okay, that means that is rich in ammonia, strong solution and rich solution are same. Okay. Similarly, weak solution means the solution that is weak in ammonia. Okay. So, if you are applying this nomenclature, strong solution means the solution that is leaving the absorber in this case, whereas in uh, water lithium bromide case, strong solution means the solution that is entering into the absorber. So, you have to keep this difference in mind. Since we are defining uh, strong and weak solutions in this manner, the definition of uh, circulation ratio will be different and also the expression for circulation ratio will be different. Okay. So, what is the expression for circulation ratio? Okay. So, circulation ratio here is uh, defined as the ratio of weak solution to refrigerant flow rate. Okay. So, weak solution is m dot w s, refrigerant flow rate is simply m dot. Okay. So, circulation ratio lambda is equal to m dot w s by m dot. This implies that the weak solution flow rate m dot w s is equal to lambda into m dot and strong solution flow rate is nothing but 1 plus lambda into m dot. This you can easily get by applying mass balance across the absorber. Okay. And from uh, mass balance across the absorber, you can also show that uh, if you are assuming uh, pure ammonia is circulating in the refrigerant circuit, you can write the expression for circulation ratio in terms of strong solution concentration zeta s and weak solution concentration zeta w. Okay. So, this expression is different uh, for water and lithium bromide system and for ammonia water system. So, this is one difference you must keep in mind while performing uh, calculations. Okay, so, due to the presence of rectification column with deflag matter, equations for mass and energy balance will be different for this system. Okay. How they are different? Let us see. So, what we do here is we take a control volume, this is a control volume across the complete entire rectifying uh, rectification column. Okay. That means, I am taking the entire rectifying column, rectification column. Okay. So, this includes the generator here and the rectification column here and the deflag matter. Okay. So, deflag matter D, rectification column R and the generator G are all taken into this control volume okay. and then you apply the mass and energy balance to this control volume. If you are applying the energy balance to this control volume, Q G minus Q D is a net heat transfer into the, into the control volume because you are supplying heat Q G. Uh, at the generator and you are rejecting uh, heat Q D at the deflag matter. So, Q G minus Q D is a net heat input into the system by way of external heat supply. This should be equal to the energy leaving the control volume and what is the energy leaving the control volume? Energy leaving is, the, is nothing but energy carried by the um, uh, vapor at point 10 and energy carried by the solution at point 6 minus energy coming into the control volume by way of mass flow okay, that is 4. So, you can easily write energy balance Q G minus Q D like this. Okay. And again uh, m dot 10 is nothing but your refrigerant flow rate m dot if you are assuming perfect rect rectification. And what is m dot 6? m dot 6 is nothing but your weak solution okay, m dot w s. And m dot w s as you have seen just now is nothing but circulation ratio into mass flow rate of refrigerant. And m dot 4 that is this, okay. m dot 4 is nothing but your strong solution uh, flow rate. And strong solution flow rate we have seen just now is nothing but 1 plus circulation ratio into refrigerant flow rate. So, if you are substituting these expressions in this one, you can finally show that Q G minus Q D is equal to m dot into H 10 minus H 4 plus lambda into H 6 minus H 4. So, this is the expression for, okay. so this is the expression for uh, 
uh, net uh, heat flow into the uh, control volume. Now from the above equation we can calculate QZ minus QD but if you want to find out the COP you need to know QZ because that is the finally the heat input to the system. Okay. So first calculate QZ minus QD using the above energy balance equation for the control volume then you have to calculate somehow QD so that finally you can get QZ. So how do we do this? So this requires estimation of heat transfer in the deflagmator. Obviously you have to find out what is the heat transfer uh, to the heat sink in the deflagmator that is QD. Okay. And this can be obtained by applying mass and energy balance across the deflagmator section. So I will show you the deflagmator section now. Okay. So what we are uh, doing here is I have taken a control volume, this is again a control volume across the deflagmator section. You know remember that this is your deflagmator and this is a part of your rectification column. You can take this control volume at any place, you can include any uh, cross section here. Okay. But the outlet here uh, must include the uh, vapor. Okay. And you can show by uh, from mass and energy balance for this uh, mass and energy balance. Okay. For this control volume you can show that um, you can arrive at this expression QD by M dot. QD is the heat rejected in the deflagmator divided by M dot. M dot is the refrigerant flow rate from the system. So QD by M dot is equal to HIV. HIV is nothing but the vapor enthalpy at any cross section minus H10. H10 is nothing but the enthalpy of the refrigerant vapor leaving this section plus 1 minus zeta IV divided by zeta IV minus zeta EL into HIV minus HEL. What is uh, zeta EL and uh, HEL? Zeta EL and HEL are the enthalpy and the composition of liquid that is coming that is descending in this section. Okay. So, zeta E L and uh, HEL refer to the liquid uh, properties, the liquid that is descending. Remember that in this section liquid is descending and vapor is ascending, okay. vapor is ascending and they exchange heat and mass. So you can uh, arrive at this expression easily by applying mass and energy balance. So finally this is written as HIV minus H10 plus HL. Okay. So if you are plotting the same thing on enthalpy uh, composition diagram, you can show that uh, I am plotting this an enthalpy com composition diagram. What I have done is I have uh, marked the condition of uh, the vapor that is ascending and the liquid that is descending at any cross section. Okay. So that is shown by point V and L and then I have joined uh, the points V and L by a straight line. Okay. You join it by a straight line and you extend this straight line so that it ent intercepts this uh, xi is equal to 1 line at this point R. Okay. This is an important point R. Okay. So this point R, uh, I will uh, show you a little later, is uh, known as pole of the rectifier. Okay. So from the uh, expression shown earlier, it can be very easily shown that the distance between this point R and this point is nothing but QD by M. Okay. Remember that this analysis is based on the assumption that the vapor that is leaving the section is pure refrigerant. That means you are assuming that vapor is leaving at a co concentration of 1. Okay. If you are assuming that then this vertical distance is nothing but QD by M and this distance is equal to HL. Okay. What is HL? Okay, so HL is uh, uh, this. Okay, this is HL, and this is given by this expression. Okay, uh, whatever is there in the bracket, that is one minus zeta IV divided by zeta IV minus zeta EL, and HIV minus HEL. And what is this? You can uh, easily see from uh, the above, from enthalpy composition diagram that HIV minus HEL divided by xi iv minus xi il okay this is nothing but the slope of the line okay let me show that so this is nothing but uh, uh, the expression in the bracket is nothing but the slope of this line so obviously the slope of that line into this distance will give you uh, the enthalpy difference between this point and this point that is known as hl okay uh, 
So this is how you can plot the enthalpy composition uh, diagram of this uh, uh, defragmented section and you can arrive at these points. Now how do we calculate QD because ultimately we would like to calculate QD okay. So point R as I said is called as pole of the rectifier and it can be shown easily that the ordinate of pole R is equal to QD by M plus H10 okay. So H10 is nothing but the enthalpy of the vapor leaving the uh, defragmented section which can be easily obtained from refrigerant property table. So you know H10. So if you can find out the uh, ordinate R then you can easily find out QD by M dot okay. So this is the principle and as I have already said uh, this HL is equal to this quantity where uh, this one is your uh, slope of the line that multiplied this will give you the enthalpy difference. And it should be noted that the line joining points L and V on enthalpy composition diagram need not be an isotherm. What it means is that uh, points V and L need not be in equilibrium with each other. That means we have uh, drawn the enthalpy composition diagram by not assuming any equilibrium or anything. You need not assume anything. Okay. So you simply say uh, take one section of the uh, lower part of the defragmentor and then simply apply the energy and mass balance and uh, the V and L need not be in equilibrium but they have to satisfy the mass and energy balance. So that is the only requirement. Okay. And for rectification to proceed it is essential that at every cross section the temperature of the vapor should be higher than that of the liquid. This is an essential condition otherwise rectification cannot proceed. That means the vapor should always be hotter than the liquid. So this is possible only if the slope of the line passing through the pole R is always steeper than the isotherm in the two phase region passing through uh, the liquid uh, state points HEL and zeta EL. Okay. So this condition has to be met that means when you are uh, taking out some heat in the defragmentor you have to make sure that the line joining the points V and L are always uh, steeper than the isotherms in the two phase region. Okay. Only then uh, vapor will be hotter than the liquid. Okay, only when vapor is hotter than the liquid then heat transfer can take place from the vapor and liquid and the mass transfer can take place from the liquid to vapor. Okay. Uh, so this has to be ensured and this has to be ensured only by controlling your uh, heat rejected in the defragmentor. Okay. Uh, as I said this can be placed uh, ensured by placing the pole R at a sufficiently high level on the zeta is equal to 1 axis. And this in turn fixes the minimum amount of reflux and the heat rejected at the defragmentor. It is observed that for ammonia water mixers the condition that the vapor must always be warmer than the liquid is satisfied by drawing a straight line through R steeper than the isotherm passing through the strong solution feed point 4. So that means what you have to do is uh, normally uh, from the uh, properties and uh, from the operating temperatures and pressures we know the condition of the feed. And if what is the feed? Feed means a strong solution that is entering into the rectification system. Okay. So you know the condition of that. So you can mark that point on the enthalpy composition diagram. Okay. So first mark the condition of the feed on the enthalpy composition diagram. Then uh, draw an isotherm uh, passing through this point. Okay. And uh, then you have to choose the condition of the pole in such a way that uh, the line joining uh, the vapor and liquid uh, points at any part of the defragmentor section is steeper than the isotherm passing through the uh, feed point 4. Okay. So this is the this is what you have to do. Okay. Once you do this uh, you can find the um, uh, pole because pole is nothing but the interception between the point joining the vapor and liquid and the zeta is one line. Okay. So you can find out the uh, position of the pole. Once you find the position of the pole you can find out QD by M. Okay. And why, why, why are we doing this because you want to find out QZ because you know QZ minus QD. And, uh, and if you know QD you can find out QZ. Okay, so this is the procedure here. A complicated procedure uh, the position of R is fixed from this and the minimum amount of defragmentor heat QD minimum is determined. However, we find that in actual case the actual defragmentor heat uh, will be larger than the minimum amount obtained in this manner. Okay, and the ratio of minimum defragmentor heat to actual defragmentor heat is called as rectifier efficiency eta r. So rectifier efficiency eta r is defined as a QD minimum by QD actual. So QD minimum can be uh, determined uh, from the procedure explained now and you have to know eta r so that you can find out QD actual. And it is observed that the rectifier efficiency eta r depends on the design of contact surface used for the rectification column. That means what kind of a surface you are using is it a plate column or is it a 
uh, pack bed or is it a spray column uh, so depending upon that you have to find the eta r and uh, so once you know the eta r and qd minimum find qd actual okay so this is the procedure so thus to evaluate the actual performance details regarding rectifying column are required you must have noticed that the calculations uh, uh, for water, wa ammonia water systems are much more complicated compared to water lithium bromide systems. All this complication is coming because of the lower boiling point di temperature difference between ammonia and water. But this is something which cannot be avoided, okay? Because uh, if you neglect this, uh, you find that uh, um, uh, there is a lot of water in the re refrigerant circuit. And if you if you don't consider the presence of water there, then the first of all the system may not function properly, and the calculations will be different from the actual calculations. Okay. So, if you want to predict the performance uh, properly, you have to have the details of the rectification column, the construction details and all that and then you have to carry out this complicated analysis presented now and only then you can arrive at uh, reasonably accurate values. Okay. Sometimes the, the details may not be available and you have to do calculations uh, uh, without these the details. So, what is done uh, in such cases? Uh, is uh, when you in the absence of required data, the COP is calculated by assuming that the deflagmator heat is a certain percentage of generator heat. Okay. So, normally you take a value of about 10 to 20 percent. That means, uh, what you do is you carry out the steady flow analysis of the system, okay, taking the control volume across the entire uh, uh, rectifying system. Okay. So, as we have seen that will give you QZ minus QD, okay, which can be obtained easily. Then you assume that QD is a certain percentage of uh, QZ. Okay, if you are making this assumption, uh, then you can calculate QZ. Okay, so this is a faster way of calculating. Of course, uh, this is not very accurate, and you also have to know what is this percentage. So normally, a value of 10 to 20 percent is taken uh, in actual calculations. Okay. Now let us uh, the systems we discussed so far, uh, both water lithium bromide systems as well as ammonia water systems. Are, con are known as conventional absorption refrigerant systems. And you have seen that uh, they do not run purely on uh, heat because you also have to have a uh, certain amount of mechanical energy to run the solution pump. Okay. So, they are not purely heat operated systems because certain amount of uh, mechanical energy is also required. Okay. So, you also have absorption systems known as pumpless absorption systems. Okay. As the name implies, a pumpless absorption refrigerant system does not have a pump. Okay. Uh, let us look at some of these systems and what are the features of these systems. So, as the name indicates, these systems do not, do not need a mechanical pump. And what are the advantages of not having a pump? The advantages are high reliability with little maintenance due to absence of moving parts. So, in a pumpless uh, refrigerant system, you do not have a moving uh, component at all. Okay. So, once you do not have any moving component, reliability will be extremely high okay because there is a frankly speaking there is nothing that can go wrong in a pumpless system okay and practically no servicing is also not requ is required okay so no maintenance is required no servicing is required and very high reliability okay so this is one major advantage of pumpless system okay and uh, since you do not have any mo moving parts the operation will be perfectly silent in fact, you do not know whether the system is working or not because it does not make any noise. Okay. Only when you feel the uh, inside, you know that it is working. And a wide variety of heat sources can be used to run the systems. So, what are the applications of pumpless systems? The applications are uh, refri as refrigerators for remote and rural areas, in portable refrigerators and as refrigerators for luxury hotel rooms, etc. Okay. In luxury hotel rooms, uh, uh, the customers do not want to have any noise. Okay. So, it has to be perfectly noiseless uh, inside the room. Okay. So, if you are using a normal uh, mechanical uh, vapor compression system, uh, uh, the compressor will be making noise. Okay. So, sometimes uh, this will be disturbing. Okay. So, in uh, 5 star hotels and all, uh, they use uh, the pumpless absorption systems. As I said, since it does not have any moving components, it does not make any noise. Okay. So, this is one of the uh, major applications of pumpless absorption systems. Okay. There are several uh, pumpless systems uh, using both water lithium bromide and ammonia water. Okay. So, people have been working on these systems for la the last many decades. But out of these systems, the most popular one is what is known as platen munter system or triple fluid vapor absorption refrigerant systems. Okay, so, let us look at uh, platen munter systems now. 
Platon Munter system if you remember from our first lecture is the name of uh, the inventors Platon and Munters and uh, this system uses ammonia as refrigerant, water as absorbent and a third fluid uh, hydrogen as the inert gas. That is the reason why you call these systems as triple fluid vapor absorbent systems okay, because you have three fluids. Unlike conventional systems the total pressure is constant throughout the system. So, since the total pressure is constant throughout the system you do not require a compressor or pump for pressurizing. Okay. So, you at the same time you also do not require any expansion valve because the entire system operates at a single pressure. So, you do not require uh, anything for pressurizing the working fluid. Okay. So, this is the major uh, uh, principle behind the these systems. Okay. So, no need for mechanical pump. And to allow the refrigerant to evaporate at low temperatures in the evaporator, an inert gas is introduced into the evaporator absorber of the system. Okay. So, if the uh, you have to when you are discussing pumpless uh, systems particularly plate and motor systems you have to make a distinction between total pressure and partial pressure. So, far we have been talking about the pressure. Okay. So, in this particular system uh, you have uh, a partial pressure and a total pressure. Okay. So, the total pressure is the same inside the system inside the entire system, okay. but the partial pressure will be different. Okay. So, let us look at this. Let me first explain the principle. Okay. So, this is a schematic of uh, typical plate and motor system. This consists of a condenser, an evaporator, an absorber, a generator here and another component called as bubble pump. Okay. For uh, the sake of simplicity I have uh, not shown the rectification column, deflagmator and all that, but in an actual system th those things will be there. Okay. So, we are assuming that we do not have any of those things. At the same time we are getting pure ammonia at the end of this uh, bubble pump. Okay. So, let me explain the working principle starting with this point. So, at this point you have pure ammonia refrigerant okay. and this is at a high pressure. So, this pure ammonia refrigerant at high pressure enters into the condenser where it rejects the heat of condensation okay. and what you have at the exit of condenser is liquid ammonia, okay. liquid ammonia at high pressure. Now, this liquid ammonia at high pressure enters into the evaporator. Okay. So, in the evaporator in addition to ammonia we also have a third fluid called hydrogen. Okay. So, you have a pure hydrogen here. Right. In fact, this pure hydrogen makes up for most of the pressure in the evaporator. Since total pressure is same, for example, pressure at this point is let us say 15 bar. Okay. So, 15 bar liquid is entering into the evaporator and inside the evaporator the partial pressure of hydrogen is 14 bar let us say. Okay. So, hydrogen is uh, exerting a partial pressure of Uh, 14 bar here. So, 14 bar is uh, because of hydrogen. So, what will be the pressure of ammonia here? The pressure of ammonia has to be the partial pressure of uh, ammonia because the total pressure is constant. So, in evaporator section you find that P total is equal to P ammonia plus P hydrogen okay. and the P total as we have seen is equal to 15 bar. And out of this 15 bar, hydrogen is making up for the 14 bar. Okay, so that means the partial pressure of ammonia has to be one bar. Okay, so there is a sudden. This is somewhat similar to an expansion, but it's not expanding by, by throttling or anything. But it is by simply expanding by simply entering into a vessel where a third fluid is exerting a major portion of the pressure. Okay, so during this process, the ammonia pressure drops from 15 bar to 14 bar. So here you have liquid ammonia at 1 bar, 1 bar ammonia liquid. Okay. Now, this 1 bar ammonia liquid uh, can uh, evaporate uh, at very low temperature because you find that at 1 bar it has an evaporation temperature of about minus 33 degree centigrade. Okay. So, in the evaporator it can evaporate uh, at minus 33 degree centigrade by taking heat from the refrigerated space. Okay. So, that is how you get the refrigeration effect. Now, as it evaporates what happens a vapor is formed. Okay. So, you see here that at point 3 vapor of uh, hydrogen and ammonia which are cooler because they are in the evaporator they go down because of buoyancy. Okay. So, this vapor consisting of ammonia and uh, hydrogen goes to the absorber. In the absorber what happens is the weak solution that is coming from the bubble pump. Okay. The weak solution coming from the bubble pump comes in contact with the mixture of hydrogen and ammonia. 
Okay. So, when uh, they come in contact what happens is ammonia is taken out from this mixer that means this solution uh, absorbs ammonia and it cannot absorb hydrogen. So, hydrogen is left out and ammonia is absorbed okay. and in this process hydrogen temperature increases. Okay. Since its temperature increases it becomes lighter and it moves up to the evaporator. Okay. So, that is how the hydrogen circulation is maintained from so you have closed uh, hydrogen circulation from evaporator to the absorber because of the buoyancy effects. Okay. Now, what happens to the solution? Here you have solution now which is now stronger in this is a strong solution uh, stronger in ammonia. Now, this is also at 15 bar. So, this goes to the generator in the generator heat is supplied. So, when uh, heat is supplied in the generator vapor bubbles are generated. Okay. So, you have vapor bubbles generated in the okay in the generator and vapor bubbles because of the buoyancy they move up. So, as they move up they carry some liquid along with them. Okay. So, that is a function of the bubble pump. So, in what are, what are we doing in a bubble pump? In the bubble pump the vapor bubbles move the liquid from the bottom to the top because of buoyancy. Okay. So, this goes on till the end of the till the top of the bubble pump. At the top of the bubble pump liquid goes down because of the gravity and vapor moves up because of the uh, by and see. Okay, so that is how the whole system uh, works. And you can see here that we are uh, rejecting heat at uh, absorber, rejecting heat at condenser, supplying heat uh, in the form of low temperature uh, uh, heat at uh, evaporator, and the high temperature heat input takes place at the generator. In addition to that, you also have to uh, supply certain energy for the bubble pump to operate. Okay, so here energy is required for generating the vapor as well as for operating the bubble pump. Okay. And remember that the total pressure is constant at every point. When I say constant, there will be small differences because of the gravity heads and all. For example, if you look at this one, pressure at this point will be uh, higher than the pressure um, at this point because of gravity head. Okay. So, this is the working principle of this and refrigeration is produced as a partial pressure of ammonia in evaporator is much smaller than the total pressure due to the presence of hydrogen as I have already explained. And uh, I am just giving an example if the total pressure as I said is 15 bar then it can condense at 38 degree centigrade and the partial pressure of hydrogen is 14 bar. So, partial pressure of ammonia is 1 bar in the evaporator that means it can evaporate at a minimum temperature of minus 33 degree centigrade. Now, the liquid ammonia in the evaporator cannot boil in the evaporator as its partial pressure is lower than the total pressure. So, this one uh, subtle difference is there between uh, this system and the earlier system. Here because of the presence of uh, hydrogen boiling cannot take place. What takes place is evaporation that means you will not find any vapor bubbles here simply the uh, ammonia liquid uh, evaporates into the hydrogen gas. So, this is somewhat similar to the evaporation of liquid water in atmosphere. Okay. This uh, takes place as long as hydrogen gas is not saturated with ammonia and the ammonia vapor generated is carried away by the process of diffusion. Hence, plate and monitor systems are also called as diffusion absorption system. Sometimes people use the name diffusion absorption systems for plate and monitor systems. So, as I said why do we call it as diffusion absorption system? Because here the process is not one of boiling, but it is one of evaporation and then diffusion. Okay. So, this is a subtle difference right. So, that is why we call it as diffusion absorption systems. Okay. Due to the evaporation process of the temperature of the evaporating liquid changes along the length of the evaporator. This is another difference. You will find that inside the evaporator the temperature is not constant. Okay. You have a cold region and you have a progressively increasing region with the progressively increasing temperature. And the coldest part is obtained at the end where hydrogen enters the evaporator. So, why the, this part is coldest? Because at this part the partial pressure of ammonia is least. Okay. So, it can evaporate at lowest temperature. This can be beneficially used to provide two temperature sections in the evaporator. For example, if you are using this system for a refrigerator, you can use the coldest part for frozen food storage and the uh, so relatively warmer part for fresh food storage. This is what is done in commercial uh, refrigerators. Uh, and the uh, circulation of fluids inside the system is achieved as I said due to the effects of buoyancy and gravity head. And the liquid field is required at the end of the condenser to prevent the entry of hydrogen gas into the condenser. That means, 
uh, at this point you have to have a liquid field. Okay. Uh, if you do not have this liquid field what happens is some of the hydrogen can enter uh, into the condenser. Okay. Hydrogen can enter into the condenser. To prevent the hydrogen entry we have to provide a liquid field. Okay, gases other than hydrogen can also be used even though the original system used hydrogen gas people also tried other gases such as helium. And platen monitor systems uh, are uh, simple and uh, good in many ways. Uh, one major disadvantage of this system is that they offer very low COPs okay, and the COPs are of the order of 0 0.15 to 0 0.2 and this is because of the energy requirement of bubble pump and also due to various irreversibilities. One such irreversibility is due to the cooling and heating of hydrogen gas in the evaporator absorber section. And additional heat exchangers are used in commercial systems to improve COP. Okay. Commercial systems will be different from the schematic shown uh, earlier. Okay. However, in commercial systems a wide variety of fuels such as uh, electrical heaters in small systems or you can also use natural gas or LPG or kerosene in larger systems. Okay. Again let me um, Okay, a typical as I was mentioning uh, of the heat exchanger part you can have a in a commercial system you can have a heat exchanger here where the cold uh, vapor that is going to the absorber section can uh, transfer heat uh, can take heat from the hot vapor that is going to the hot hydrogen gas that is going to the evaporator. So, you will have one heat exchanger here. Okay. Similarly, you can have another heat exchanger here. Okay. So, that means you can preheat the solution that is going to the generator okay. and uh, the heat source here can be anything. You can use for example, LPG gas or you can use natural gas. You can also use kerosene, you can use hot water or you can use hot oil or anything. Okay. And uh, let me very briefly explain the solar energy driven uh, systems. I will not explain, but I will just state uh, absorption systems can also be run purely on uh, solar energy. If you are using a conventional system, then the solution pump requires, which requires mechanical energy can be driven using a turbine driven by the high pressure vapor generated in the generator. That means, you can have a turbine which uh, utilizes some of the high pressure vapor generated in the generator or you can also use photovoltaic cells and have a motor and run the pump using that motor. Okay. And if you are using a pumpless system, of course, uh, you do not require any mechanical energy and you can operate it purely on solar energy alone. Now. And solar energy driven reference systems can also use what is known as solid adsorbents. Okay. Some of the examples of solid adsorbents are water silica gel where water is the refrigerant, silica gel is adsorbent, water zeolites, zeolite is adsorbent, methanol like activated carbon system, methanol is a refrigerant and activated carbon is a refrigerant, ammonia calcium chloride system, hydrogen metal hydrate systems. Okay. However, these systems have not been commercialized on a large scale. Let me just show a table where the compression systems are compared with absorption systems. Okay, so, this uh, table shows the uh, comparison between compression and absorption systems. So, you can see that compression systems are work operated, absorption systems are heat operated, compression systems offer high FOP, absorption systems offer low FOP. Now, let me quickly summarize what we have learned in this lesson. In this lecture, uh, working principle of ammonia water systems is explained, principle of rectification is discussed method for evaluating steady state performance is presented and pumpless systems are discussed and solar energy driven systems are mentioned and finally, comparison is made between compression and absorption systems. In the next le le lecture, le we will look at some of the problems on compression and absorption systems. Thank you.